Hey everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here, coming to you on location today. And I want to talk about the top six mistakes I see wildlife photographers make in the field. Now you're probably familiar with these mistakes because if you're like me, you've probably committed one or all of them at some time or another. However, I think what's kind of insidious about these mistakes is that you can actually make these mistakes and still get a good photo but it's just not going to be a great photo. Basically, these mistakes can take what would have been a wonderful, compelling, impactful photograph and turn it into a snapshot. And I think that's what's really, really tricky about them. So in this video, I want to cover these six mistakes so that we can kind of raise awareness and understand that they maybe are a little more serious than they appear to be at first glance. Let's go. Mistake number one, not paying attention. Now, this first one is kind of divided up into two different types of mistakes. The first one is not paying attention to what's happening in your viewfinder because you're getting distracted. This happens all the time. I see it in the field. I done it myself and it's very very painful because it costs shots what happens is typically this you're waiting for an animal to do something the animals perched or standing there and you're waiting for it to look or give you a certain expression or take off or whatever the problem is as time goes on and what you're waiting for to happen doesn't happen you start to get impatient so if you're holding a big lens maybe you're gonna let that lens drop and you're gonna rest for a second or maybe you're with somebody and you turn and you talk to them or you get distracted by something else it's at that moment of course that the animal does exactly what you were hoping it was going to do. The best photographers keep their eye to the viewfinder all the time. If they're using a heavy lens, they're going to stick a monopod or tripod under it. If they're with friends, they're going to talk to them, but they're going to keep that eye on the viewfinder as they're talking. They're not going to bring the camera around and turn around. They're not going to get distracted. They're going to get the shot. The second type of mistake I see is when people don't check their settings. Every time you bring that camera to your eye, you should look at at least three things. You should look at your shutter speed, your f-stop, and your ISO. Those are the big three, but it doesn't hurt to double check your AF area, metering modes, and things like that. But if you could just check the big three, shutter speed, f-stop, and ISO, it would prevent so many bad shots. I've seen so many shots that turn into throwaways or very mediocre shots or unusable shots because the photographer simply didn't check their settings before they shot. Get in the habit. Every time you bring it up, look down there and kind of force yourself to do that. Mistake number two, not shooting from the right height. Another mistake I see all the time in the wildlife photography world is not shooting at the right height. For most wildlife shots, not every one of them, but most wildlife shots, your best bet is to be at eye level or maybe just a little bit below. Unfortunately, that's the exception rather than the rule. Almost all the time when I see a photographer shooting an animal that's low and on the ground, this is what they look like. They're shooting down on the animal like that. That does not make a great shot. That does not create a sense of connection and intimacy with the animal and the viewer. What you want to do is you want to get to eye level or a little bit lower, and sometimes you can go extreme and get all the way on the ground, but those kind of shots are the ones that have impact. If you want a snapshot, shoot down on an animal. If you want to photograph, get to eye level. Again, this is going to create a real sense of intimacy between your viewer and the subject, and that is going to give your photo a ton of impact that it otherwise wouldn't have. The other cool thing, especially for really low shots, is that when you get low like that, the foreground and background sort of visually pile up and compress, and it really gives the subject a sense of kind of isolation and 3D pop. So that's kind of an added bonus for smaller animals, but you're gonna to have to get all the way on the ground to do it. Mistake number three, not paying attention to the background. If you've ever been on a workshop with my wife and I, you know what we say all the time, right? Watch your backgrounds. We're shouting it constantly to our participants because it's so important. For me, the background is what makes or breaks a wildlife shot. I can have the best shot in the world, but if it's a crummy background, it's a no-go. So what do we wanna do here to get better backgrounds? The first thing that I do is when I see an animal, I immediately start looking for backgrounds. When I'm approaching that animal, I'm trying to figure out what angle I'm gonna shoot from, I'm gonna be looking at the background as much or more than the animal. I wanna have a nice, beautiful background behind him. What I'm trying to avoid is having something like a solid background with bright spots in it, because those bright spots are the first thing our eyes look for in a photo. It's gonna go for those bright areas. If you have a relatively solid background with some bright spots in it, your eye's gonna go right to those first, and it's gonna avoid the subject, and that's the exact opposite of what we wanna have happen. So I'm gonna look for those bright spots, I'm gonna to try to maneuver around so I don't see those bright spots. So those bright spots can be clouds, or they could be bright sticks, bright vegetation, you gotta watch for all of that stuff. 
The other thing I'm gonna avoid is animals that are super close to a background because another thing our eyes go for are areas of sharpness and contrast. If we have a nice sharp contrasty subject against a nice sharp contrasty background, it makes the photograph very visually confusing, especially if it's kind of a cluttered background and not very uniform. And that's gonna draw the eye from the subject to the background and back and forth, and it's not going to be a very impactful photo. So we're trying to avoid that. We're also trying to avoid distractions in the background, things that draw the viewer's eye away. And this could be just you know something very colorful or bright, like a building or something behind there. You don't want anything in that background that's going to pull the viewer away. Instead, what I look for are more or less solid, distant backgrounds that are gonna be complementary to the subject and not compete with it. I don't necessarily want super creamy, smooth backgrounds every time. I do enjoy those from time to time. But what I would like is a background that's just out of focus enough that I have a notion of the habitat, but it's still complementing the subject and adding to the photo, not pulling the viewer's attention away from my target. Mistake number four, not getting out during the best light. First, I wanna apologize for the kind of jarring continuity difference here. Obviously, we're not outside anymore. When I was putting the video together, I noticed a technical error with this little part of the video. So I'm gonna reshoot it here in the studio, but I promise you're gonna go back outside before you know it. So let's talk about not getting out during the best light. So first, I think we have to define what the best light is. Now, for me personally, I like that 20 minutes after sunrise and that 20 minutes before sunset. Those ranges of light are always so good, especially with clear skies, or obviously with clear skies. Now, that doesn't mean those are the only times I'm going to shoot, of course. I actually will shoot happily up to like an hour and a half after sunrise, and I'll start shooting maybe an hour and a half before sunset. And I'll shoot right within those ranges, and that's usually pretty nice light. And of course, we can't forget about overcast. Overcast gives you an all-day shoot if you get lucky enough to have it all day. So I'm always happy to go out on an overcast day. I prefer bright overcast, but you know what? I'll take any kind of overcast versus like a really bright sun in a blue sky that's just throwing a bunch of harsh light. Now, the mistake I see people make is that they arrive an hour and a half after sunrise and they go home an hour and a half before sunset. I see this all the time. In fact, we were in Florida recently and I saw this pattern multiple times with different people. And the thing is, when you're shooting in that harsh light during the middle of the day, it's not that you can't get a good shot or maybe even a great shot. It's just that I know personally that anytime I've taken similar shots, one with harsh light and one in the same location, same animal during those you know, golden hours, the difference is striking. So it does make a big difference. And if you want your photos to have maximum impact, you really need to make sure that you get out during that time of day when the light is really good. Now, obviously, sometimes you're in a situation where you're on a trip and you have to shoot during harsh light. If that happens, there's two things you can do to help minimize the impact. The first is to always keep the light at your back as much as possible so you don't have any hard shadows on the animal. The other one is to try to find animals in shade. And if it's sunny and bright and hot out, a lot of times they're seeking shade, so that works really well, too. Still, you should always do your best to make sure you're out during the best light. Number five, shooting subjects that are just too far away. The other problem I see all the time, you guys have probably seen this too, people shoot subjects that are just too far away. And I realize that everyone's excited and you wanna take that photograph, but you always need to be within range of an animal. The problem is when you shoot a subject that's just too far away, that subject's not gonna have detail. You're gonna take it home, you're gonna crop it in, you're gonna say, gee, it's not as sharp as I'd like, I don't see as much detail. In addition, subjects that are too far away also often lack subject isolation. Because what's happening is if you have a subject that's very distant, no matter how distant the background is behind it, it's still gonna have a lot of sharpness and contrast to it because everything is so far away, you're gonna have massive depth of field. So you're gonna lose subject isolation. So when you crop in, it's just not gonna look as good as had you been closer. The other problem is noise. Because here's the thing, when you have a small subject in the frame, it's more easily overwhelmed by noise because there's just not a lot of detail there and the detail that is there is very tiny compared to what it would be if it were filling the frame. So this means your relative output noise is much, much worse. 
So if I were to take a full frame image of something at say ISO 1600 and someone else had a much shorter lens and was shooting at that same ISO, but they had to crop in severely, would we looked at those images side by side? If we made prints of each one, mine would look like it was shot at 16, but the other one might look like it was shot at 32 or even 6400. Now, if you want more information on how all of this works, it does get a little bit confusing. I'll put a card above and I'll put a little information there at the end of the video so you can click over and take a look at the video I have that covers all of this in detail. Number six, not thinking about composition. Another problem I see all the time is photographers not thinking about composition. In fact, probably nine out of 10 times when I look at another photographer's raw files, the animal is smack dab right in the center of the frame. And the problem is that it creates, actually creates two problems. The first problem is that if you do that all the time and you're counting on using the crop tool later on to create your composition, what's gonna happen is subconsciously you're gonna start cropping a little bit looser in the field so you have that room back on the computer. So you're giving up pixels, you're giving up detail, and a lot of times you're giving up subject isolation and even ISO performance when you do that. Now on the other hand, if you're doing the right thing and filling the frame the way you should, this means that you're compositionally limited when you get back to the computer with a crop tool because you're not gonna be able to crop very much or at all and what you got in the field is kind of what you're stuck with. And of course, we all should be filling the frame as best we can. So what you wanna do is when you're in the field is really think about composition. Where should that animal go in the frame? Are there elements in the frame you can balance the animal out with? I do that all the time. I'm constantly thinking, where do I wanna put this animal in the frame? And most of the time the answer is not smack dab in the center. In addition, most of the time I have a grid on that shows me a rule of thirds grid right in the viewfinder so I can very quickly experiment with compositions in the field because wildlife's obviously not gonna be very patient with us. So turn on your rule of thirds grid and it can make a huge difference when you're in the field because you can very quickly come up with compositions or test different things and maybe come up with some interesting stuff. So there you have it. Those are my top six mistakes. And again, like I said at the beginning of the video, I realize they're kind of common mistakes and you probably knew most of them. And if you're like me, you've definitely committed all of them at one time or another. Now, the thing is, again, I want to stress that they're kind of insidious though, because it doesn't seem like they're all that important in a lot of cases. It seems like you kind of can ignore them and still get a good shot. And that's true. But again, if you want to go from snapshot level to just jaw-dropping photograph level, you really have to pay attention to these mistakes and make sure you're not making them in the field because if you avoid them, your photos are going to have a whole lot more impact and you're going to be a whole lot happier with what you're getting. As always, make sure you check out the educational materials at my site. Everything I know is in those books and video workshops. In addition, here's that video that talks about how noise and cropping go together. And as always, thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.